issue with something interesting, but we can go much higher uh, than think of the foods that were in our evolutionary past. Honey, probably being one of them. It's rewarding. You, li you learn to like the volatiles or the other flavors that are paired with sweet taste. It blunts expressions of pain. It blocks the bad taste. Um, and they're attracted to this taste signal. And that's really what this is. It's really to whether something gains admission to the digestive tract or gets rejected. That's the, really the function of this periphery. And so it's, it's, uh, it's to attract that which is needed and is really needed during periods of growth. And it was probably designed for fruit. Um, so the bad news is that while evolution has shaped these tastes that are initially preferred or rejected, and our biology is not our destiny, we can learn to like uh, and manipulate a lot of different food environments and learn to like foods that aren't initially preferred. Um, but in the current food environment, this elegant biology is kind of making, I think it's rendering children quite vulnerable, um, especially if the food culture and what they're learning and what, what family members are eating, if everybody's eating that, then that is what defines what a food is. Uh, so getting back to these late night thoughts, and I want to get back to Nutcracker Man. And so what has always bugged me, and you can look at every paper, when added sugar intake is high, fruit intake is usually low. And fruit intake is low because they're expensive, they're, you know, uh, for a wide variety of different reasons. They're, they may not be available in certain um, uh, locations. Uh, but it always kind of bothered me, why isn't fruit intake, I could understand vegetable, but why isn't fruit intake higher? And this is where Nutcracker Man kind of had a little aha. So when they talked about Nutcracker Man and they talked about the, looked at his dentition and saw that he was eating fruit probably in the days before he died, uh, they talked about that there's a, a dictum, the Liam dictum, where specialized morphology can allow for a broader diet wherein a species actively avoids the very foods to which it was adapted to when other more preferred resources are available. And so that was Nutcracker Man. He got these delicious fruits and that's what he was eating. So it got me to thinking, are fruits competing with added sugars and non-nutritive sweeteners? Is it so high, you know, and, you, and I go back to the, the, some of the animal model work that was done in the 70s in rats. You can have a rat, a 0.3 molar a sucrose solution can be the best thing it ever ate put that rat on a 0.6 molar, and they don't even look at the 0.3. But that may be what's going on. We're adapting to, to levels, and it, it's competing with the very foods it probably was designed for. So are they really super normal stimuli? Is this level of the sustained and, and uh, repetitive exposure to these high levels of added sugar really becoming super normal experiences, if you will? Not only are they, and, and are they adapting? Is it also when the child has the, the, the blueberry or the strawberry, it's not as sweet as it would be if, it, if they had a diet that was devoid of it. And so I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts. I think that uh, there are, you know, there, there, whenever I talk to health professionals, or if I, you know, I often work uh, and, at WIC and we'll talk to some of the counselors there, and sugar is the only thing that they want to talk about or what the, or what the mothers want to talk about. It's a challenge. I think that from an early age, um, they're getting messages. And I've been kind of looking at this and just looking at the advertisements for sugar-sweetened beverages. When it first came out, they were often associated with uh, quenching thirst. And you'd actually see the... Uh, the ads for someone that was an athlete, or it was never associated with a meal. And when we think of the not so distant past in the last 30, 40 years, first of all, the food industry is putting the sugar in the foods for us, as well as the salt. The, the sugar bowl and the salt shaker aren't even at the table. They're adding it for you, and, they're, and you're not tasting all the sweetness in it because it's doing some other masking, and you're really not tasting all the sodium that's in a manufactured food because it's in there before the process, during the processing. And so you, 
you see that not only has that the food source has changed, but you also see that uh, all of a sudden, and it started maybe like ten, the advertisements changed, and now the the sugar sweetened beverage was on the dinner table. The first ad I ever saw was uh, in India, where you actually saw it on the in the on the dining room table with all the food. Look at the WIC package, and that's one of the things that the mothers would say. If it's so bad, why is Juicy Juice eaten in every meal? You know, why? when did it come, become where a, a liquid candy is now should be part of every child's lunch and dinner? And so it's a much, I think, much bigger issue of the socialization of these sources of added sugar. And, and all of these are teaching the child. They're all socializing the child, acculturating them to the food environment in which they're, they find themselves in. And so I'd just like to end with a quote. The central task of science is to arrive stage by stage at a clear comprehension of nature. I would, tell, I would think sweet taste is a really important aspect of that nature. But this does not mean, as it sometimes claimed to mean, a search for mastery. And I think that's maybe some of the food environment issues. So thank you. This has really been a, a thrill. And, uh, Any questions? We learn to like what we eat. But if you don't eat it, you don't learn to like it. <laughs> no, and I, I think it goes even deeper. I, what has happened in 50 years is we started feeding children separately from families. And I think that really is at the bottom of a lot of it. Uh, we have specially prepared foods. You know, most cultures, children are eating what, what the family's eating at two years of age. You know, you, you may especially, you may mash the food a little bit more. But I think by doing that, we diminish that parent's role for feeding. It was no longer that you feed what you're eating, and maybe then you could eat crappy food, <laughs> but that it, it dissociated the parent and child. And, and that's one of my things that I would say that I worry about is that when I see the industry about food for children, it's, and then that's the goal of all industries is to, to lengthen the time you have the consumer, but it's almost like delaying the inevitable. I know of no research that has looked at, you know, how repeated exposure to a manufactured food actually, it'll get the child to like, let's say, a pureed vegetable, but I know of no evidence that it likes them to eat the vegetable that's in the family meal. So I think that, that that's exactly, and that's how you empower them. And every family, every culture, you know, wants that if child to like that food that divides that family. And so they put great importance on that the child, whether they eat pasta, whatever they're eating. And so it, be, it becomes an identity. And you lose that when you have foods that are specially prepared for children that you don't eat yourself. So I think th that would empower them. So thanks. Yes? Yeah, I think the over, I mean, I think there's some research that would suggest that over restriction isn't going to work. Um, I, again, I think that there's so much that we don't know. Uh, sometimes I wonder if the not being exposed to a lot of it earlier may help in the end. 
Um, and I think sometimes when you're dealing as a practitioner, you're dealing with someone who has been feeding the food from a really early age, it's, e it's even harder to cut down. But I think that one thing is, is how much sugar is in there. And that's often, that's a big concept for people will know how many packs of sugar they'll put in their coffee, but they don't realize how much packs of sugar is in that juice or that can of Coke. And I think that the, you, it's not that it's avoid, it's to have that occasionally. Uh, and I think that there are guidelines for how much somebody should or shouldn't eat. And none of these guidelines, they're, they're saying, at least AHA is saying none before two, but then it's saying, you know, have it for an occasional treat or so. That's really difficult uh, when a child's in an environment where everybody's eating it. And so I could, I, I sympathize with those parents uh, and I think they're trying to do well, but I wonder in the end if, if not feeding that child early on actually might help in the long term. We just don't know what the end point is. And so is that struggle back and forth when they're three or four, where they're gonna struggle any way with you no matter what it is, in the long term is it gonna be easier? I don't know, and there's really not a lot of good evidence. You see these association studies where the earlier the child has added sugar, and it's the same thing for salt, and salt, we get most, the child gets most of their salt from uh, cereal products. And the earlier that they're in it, the higher their, you can measure sweet preference, the higher their sweet preference is at, let's say, two, four, six. So we don't know if it's cause and effect. We don't know if it's just a reflection of how mothers feed. But maybe avoiding early on may make it easier later on. It's just really difficult. But I think you could tell parents that the evidence suggests that total avoidance when they're older isn't going to work. And, and you don't use it as a reward either. That doesn't work. It's in the context of a dessert that you have, but it's a dessert. The issue is it's, it's not part of a, you know, that beverage is really the, the same size as the dessert. Thanks. <laughs>